Hi, I'm Isman and um, welcome to this short video on an introduction to Geodata. What I am going to attempt to do here is that I'll first show you some examples of Geodata um, and based on these examples we will generate a informal definition of what Geodata is. And finally, we'll talk about the next step in creating geodata. That is, from going from reality to geodata, there's a step long series of steps of increasing abstraction. And the first step is the concept of creating an ontology. And we'll be talking about that at the end of the video. So let's start looking at some examples. My first example is a website called One Million Treats and it does what it says on the box. It shows you the last one million treats. So each of these blue rings indicates a number of treats and each time you see a little red dot appearing on the monitor it's a new treat that has been registered. If we um, zoom in Let's say if I can zoom in on somewhere in London um, and see if any. Uh, some tweets here, 13. So here we have um, in Hyde Park a series of tweets, and um, if we click on a tweet, we um, have a text which is um, the text of the tweet, a link to the web browser version of it. Um, and we call this attribute data. So this is the text describing the tweet sent at this location. We call the location for spatial data and as mentioned this text, we call that for attribute data. And then we also have another type of data present here, namely what we call temporal data, the time that the tweet was sent. So, and these are basically the three types of data that occur in geodata. Attribute data, that is, the data that describes the location. We sometimes talk about it as the what. We have the spatial data, that's the location, we talk about it as the where, and then we have the temporal data that we talk about as the when. So we have these three data types and they almost all, always occur in geodata, all of these three types. They have different forms, they have different elements in what data is, but that's the basic building blocks of geodata. Attribute data, the what, the spatial data, the where, and the temporal data, the when. These dots here are what we call features. They are at a specific location. And um, that is one type of, of data. Basically, we have uh, two types of spatial data is distinguished between. We have feature data, that is things that describes objects or entities in reality. So call them features, so a road, a building, a treat, things like a something or other. Um, and then we have what we call property spaces or property fields, which is a distribution of a property over space, just like a gravity field, a magnetic field, things like that, pressure fields. So a field is a single property distributed throughout space. And we can see a, that type of data here also. If I, first of all, zoom a bit out, so I just say, um, so something like, uh, a bit more, I think let's zoom out. Um, so now we have Western Europe mainly. Um, and uh, if we now change to what they call a heat map, this is a density of where do we have the most treats. 
So and that's basically a property field. So it is the property we're looking at, at is treats per square kilometer. So the higher the color, the more treats there are within that spatial unit square kilometer square meter whatever unit we're working with. So we have those two main types of spatial data. We have feature data, that is a road, a building, typically a tangible thing. And then we have what we call property fields, that is a property and how it's distributed evenly through space. So it's not here we have a treat, it is how many treats do we have per square kilometer? What is the temperature? What is the wind speed? What is the air pressure? What is the elevation? That type of thing we call property fields. So those are the two main types of data and we can see both of them here in this uh, thousand treat. Uh, our thing about the thousand treat is that it demonstrates that quite a lot of geodata is really not explicitly generated. It is created because someone sent a tweet and then the data was created. Lots of that type of data is created um, as part of monitoring and things like that. Um, one, of my, one of my hobbies is to sail and um, I have um, this tweet here, oh, sorry, this website here which it shows what is called the AIS, the Automatic Identification System. So we know where the sheep, all the different boats are, and we can go in and we can click on a boat and get information about this boat, have a little picture of it. And this is real time updated. Uh, we see um, different information about the boats and if I hover about here we can see that it is um, this boat is moving along with um, 34.8 knots so it's very really fast that's because it's a, a catamaran um, while we have one out here uh, with a bit more modest 11 knots so this skin is feature data the boats are the individual features they um, how the data is collected automatically because they have this navigational system on board. There's ice um, which tells the navigational authorities which boats are where. Um, and again, their data is collected automatically. We have the same for planes, for trains, and um, even many people have their Android phones on and they are then used for Google's traffic maps. So the thing about generating spatial data, we're all generating it continuously without really thinking about it. And maybe we should be a bit more aware of that. We can of course also create data a bit more deliberately. Um, and um, one of the easiest places of doing that is to use Google My Maps. Um, I've got it up here. And um, it asked me, do I want to create a map? And I said, yep, create a map. Of course, I've logged in and things like you can see my Google account um, icon up here. So I'm logged in now. And if I can now go in and I can zoom in on, uh, let's say, um, oh, wrong way. Um, a university area. I'm going to find that there. So here we have Oscar University, oh. and um, I here have a background map, of course that's also geodata. In this case it's another type of geodata, it's what we call raster data, it's an image of a map that has been generated here. But, you know, I can also change the background so I can see uh, my data as a aerial photograph here. So, here we have um, the university with an aerial photograph. If I now want to identify some different features on, um, on this area, we might talk about our university lake here. And um, 
I want to um, start creating some information about it. So I can start by creating a line um, and basically I just can click along and that will just, um, what I'm trying to do is that I'm delimiting the border of the lake and I'll now double click on the start point so I have indicated I've created a polygon lake and I now say this um, I could um, perhaps add some add more attribute data to it so um, let's see if there is any uh, yep there was a picture of the university lake there so I have now assigned a picture of the university lake to my lake feature so this demonstrates that attribute data can be many different things it doesn't have to be a text it can be a video it can be a photograph it could be a interview recording whatever so basically I have now created a feature object here a feature it's a has the geometry type of a polygon it has as its attribute data it has the picture of the lake I can create another feature um, in this case I would like to create a um, a point data for where we will be meeting for the lectures so this is where the GIS location is at the uh, university so I click here and say GIS 1 plus 2 so that's the official room names so that is where the lectures for this course will be held I have created a piece of another feature at this time it is of the geometry type point and I've given it some attribute data its title here and I can say uh, we have our lectures here or something like it. oops no yeah, well, never mind um, so I have now created a additional feature I'll create a fan type here because I will um, create I just think I'll just move my screen a bit here because most of you will probably come by train so you'll go up by the station and you'll cross over the zebra crossing here cross down here cross over the bridge and depending on your preferences you might cross space basketball go up here and go through the pergola and perhaps into the building inside the building and to the location um, we yeah, let's say from to lecture room so I have now created three features I have deliberately chosen to create a polygon that was the lake a point that was the lecture room and a line that was the route from the station to the lecture room this is to demonstrate these are the three main types of geodata that or feature based geodata we have namely points lines and polygons the aerial photograph is again a property field in this case it is the property of how much light is emitted from the surface that's what a photograph registers so here we have the light emitted from the surface registered as how much red green and blue so matter of fact we have three property spaces that is merged together into creating what we will call a color photograph so here we have all of the main types of geodata 
that are um, available at the same screen. Just to show you some more about how GeoData functions, I will now save this map. So I export it to a format called KML. KML is Keyhole Markup Language, and um, basically it's because Google didn't invent Google Earth and things like Google Maps themselves. They bought a Dutch firm called Keyhole Technologies, and they have then been merged into the Google family. That's why the Google products still have this KML format as their data. So I'll just download it um, and I will save the. Oh, I'm at this. Uh, open it in Notepad. I open it in Notepad. That was fine. Um, so, what do we have here in Notepad? Um, basically, we have our data. Oops. Um, I don't want to do that. I just wanted to wrap the text um, in this format of KML. But what we look at, if we look at it, we can see different things in it. Um, we see here HTTP blah 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 something of our so it's a Flickr and it's a JPEG. So that's the reference to where the photograph was. Down here we say that it is a boundary and it has a ring and then we have 12.1355 point something of R, 12.13 blah blah and so on. A series of coordinate pairs. That's the coordinate pairs that defines that ring of points that I you created when I created the, the lake. So this is the spatial data we have here. Um, it is in the spatial format that you know from pirate films and things like this latitude and longitude so degrees east in this case of Greenwich and north of equator and that is one of the more common ways of storing geodata so spatial data of geodata um, if you're working with larger areas of global data sets, they're almost always saved in this format of latitudes and longitudes. So this is basically how geodata is. But what we should note is that we have gone through a series of steps. And let's look at that a bit closer. We talked about that geodata, what it was. It basically we can talk about it as it's a representation of what is, where, and when. Um, of course, this is is in present. It could have been what was, or what will be, or what I could imagine. But apart from that, it is what is, where, and when. It is typically used to represent tangible things, so roads, buildings, lakes, administrative borders, things like that. But it can also be used for representing things that are not present in the real world if you wish. So plans, scenarios for future development, um, that type of things. And although it's often thought that GIS is a very quantitative thing, we can also have at representations of qualitative elements in our geodata. You saw a picture, we can have elements of interviews and so on. So we can have quite a lot of different types of data in GIS or in geodata. Admittedly, it is often easier to work with quantitative data, but there's no rule saying that you can't use qualitative, and there's many interesting applications of using qualitative data in GIS that we might come back to throughout the course. I mentioned the three components of geodata, the attribute data, the what, the temporal data, the when, and the spatial data, the where. So in our case of our tweets, the attribute data was a tweet and who tweeted it, the temporal data was when was the tweet sent, and the spatial data was where 
the tweet was sent from. Um, if you talk about temporal and attribute data, they're relatively, you know, at, there's nothing special for geodata, but they are concerned. One thing you might you should consider is that temporal data does not necessarily have to be a timestamp of when something occurred when the tweet was sent, but it might also be information about when something was registered. So not necessarily when was a um, a when did every event happen, but more when did that event be registered. Typically, we find that on historical maps, um, they are a registration of the landscape as it looked at a specific time, so when it was registered. So, um, temporal data has this doubled element in it, and it can both be when something was happened or when it was registered. Attribute data can be um, basically anything, videos, sounds, numbers, text, whatever you want to put into your attribute data. The thing that makes geodata interesting is the spatial part. The spatial element gives, binds the data to a location on, in this case, the planet Earth. And the interesting thing is that that is the same space that we move in. So if things are given at a specific location, if we are at the same location, we might see these things. So geodata is really, or spatial information is really what makes geodata special. And where many of the more technical aspects of working with geodata comes in. Um, the spatial data has some form of coordinate system to register where it is. And uh, on this uh, KML file I open um, here, we have the location given as latitudes and longitudes. So the degrees east or west of Greenwich and north of so or south of um, of the crater. And we also saw that Ross Kilo was about 12, or the university was about 12 point 14, late was 12 point 13 east of Greenwich and about 55.6 north of equator. But that's just all that, you know, the easy part of it. The real problem is that geodata is not just a representation of reality. It's a representation of some form of abstraction of reality, of a reality. And um, in order to work with geodata, we need to understand these different layers of abstraction because they do influence what we can do with our data. Um, there are three main steps that we go through from reality to geodata. First of all, we'll have to convert our reality into some concepts. These concepts then have to be represented as what we call entities in a way that they can be digital represented. Remember, most realities are not digital, they are analog. So we need some way of converting the analog world to the digital world. And then finally, we will need some form of storing on a computer these entities in some form of database or file system. So we have all of these three steps we need to go through when we want to go from geodata, or sorry, from reality to geodata. The first step that we'll be talking about today is when we're going from reality to concept. Basically, if we, in order to see anything in reality, we need to define the concept that we can see. We can't talk about a table if we haven't defined the term table. We can't talk about a forest if we don't know what a forest is. One might even say that you can't see a forest if you haven't got the term forest. So, 
we need to define these things and we call that an ontology. Ontology is Greek meaning what really exists. So in, in geodata connections we define our ontology, we define what really is, that is what we are interested in seeing. Things that are not in our ontology we can't see. So if we define a forest then we can talk about forest. If we define a tree we can have a tree. If we haven't defined the term tree we can't represent the term the tree in our geodata. So the ontology is our initial filter through which we see our reality. So, and what we see we often call our world of observation. So that is what we can see. And we can then see roads, buildings, trees, soil units, whatever we have defined in our ontology. But it's only because they are defined in our ontology we can see them. And um, therefore later represented as geodata. See here I have put some of these in red and some in green. Um, that's because the ones in red they are our features, feature classes, and the green ones are our property spaces. So those are those two continuous elements. Um, so when we go through here, the first thing we do with our ontology is to define whether or not we want to see a feature, an object, or we want to see a property field, some thing that is continuous distributed. A feature is a representation of a phenomenon that we have seen as a whole, so a building. We, that is, we do not see it as individual rooms or the individual bricks, we see it as a entity. A, it has properties that describes an entity in its entirety, so it has elevation, it has building material, it could have numbers of rooms, it, different things like that. So. If you have a feature, it is something, it's a holistic unit if you wish, or atom if you wish, it is unbreakable. It is the smallest unit that we operate on. And it can then have properties that describes it as a whole. We can't have properties that describes some of our feature. Attributes describe the entire feature. It is the height of the building. The roof material, the building material, and so on. Property fields, on the other hand, represent something that is continuous variable. So where we don't have that concept of a of building, but we have something that is continuous in space, such as density of tweets, air pressure, temperature, elevation over sea level, things like that. They are all um, property fields. And those are the key elements that we need to define. So whenever we create an ontology for geodata, we first decide which features, or to be more specific, feature classes we operate with, and which property fields we operate with. So, features um, we don't define the individual features in our ontology. It's the feature class. It's the concept tree. It's not the individual tree. It's all of the trees. All of the, It's not the individual building. It's the concept of buildings. And um, a feature should represent the same a type of thing. So we can't have a feature that sometimes is a car and sometimes a building. It should be the same type of element that it always represents. Um, feature classes oh, um, have the same um, attributes. So all our trees must have the same attributes. So we have um, type of tree, height, width, whatever. So all of our feature 
in a specific feature class share the same attributes, the same descriptions. They have different attribute types. So if you can have a larch tree, a beech tree, an oak tree, so on. So if you can have different types of trees, then we have so the attribute species can have different values. The height can be different. The trees don't have to have the same height. Even though they have this common attribute height, the attribute value of the individual tree can be different. And of course we can then use attributes to subdivide our feature class into subtypes. We could have a feature class called roads, and we could have an attribute called type, and we could have motor road as one type, cycle paths as another type, primary roads, secondary roads, and so on. So we can use then our attribute to create subtypes. When defining a feature class, there are some things we have to decide on. First of all, we have to decide on what delimits it. So, is it the edge of the building? Now, that's relatively easy. Um, forests are a bit more difficult to delimit. When, how many trees do we need for something to be a forest? Or when is it an individual tree? So, we have to define what conditions delimited our properties or features. Then we have to decide for a geometry type. Things can have three different types of geometries, points, lines and polygons. And um, when we start using GIS systems, you'll find that typically a feature class can only be of one type. So a feature class can either be a point, a line or polygon, but not a both a line and polygons in the same feature class. That's a technical delim some limitation, but it is almost always there. Finally, we need to define what we mean by our different attributes. So, what do we mean by height? Is that meters over sea level, meters over ground? Does it include the height of the chimney if it's a building? So on. Then we need to define things like minimum mapping unit. Um, how small a building can we see? Is an outhouse a building? How small a tree is? A little twig that is coming up. Is that a tree? So we need to define some minimum units for our elements. We also need to decide our level of detail, how precise we want to be, both in time and in space. And then we also have to look at some spatial constraints. Are features allowed to overlap? Well, buildings are typically not allowed to overlap. Um, but R types might be allowed to overlap. Do we need connectivity? So, do the roads have to be connected, or can they just end in the middle of nowhere? And we also need to define our completeness. That is, do we have registered something everywhere? So those are some of the main things that we start when we work on geodata that we have to define. So these. This is a basic start of geodata. What I would like you to do now is I would like you to look at um, Bruegel's oil painting Hunters in the Snow and based on that painting try to define some feature classes and some property fields and um, you can Google to find the, the, the picture somewhere and then um, come back and see the video on how that is done. So, bye.